blood of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me now? That's what they believe. Then secondly, there's the Lutheran view. Martin Luther took issue with the Roman Catholic view of this Eucharist, which these states believe. He called it consubstantiation. Consubstantiation, the Eucharist, meaning thanksgiving, and his view became known as the consubstantiation. Con means together. And substantiation, as we've said, still meaning substance. Luther argued that rather than having complete change, the substance of the bread and the wine coexist with the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. Jesus Christ is present, he says, in, with, and under the bread and wine whenever the Lord's Supper is celebrated. And so you have transubstantiation as believed by the Roman, Roman Catholicism, consubstantiation as believed by Martin Luther, for the Lutherans. And thirdly, there was the Baptist view or memorialism. Woodrich Zwingli taught this. He said that Christ commanded us to do this in remembrance of him. And he says that is all that it is. An act of remembrance of him. The bread and wine, he says, are merely symbols reminding us that Christ's body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. And then fourthly, there's a reformed view, also referred to as the spiritual presence. This is John Calvin's take on the Lord's Supper and is known as the spiritual preference, presence or the real presence. He took strong issue with the Roman Catholic view and also disagreed with Luther. He also noted that Zwingli's view did not go fast enough, far enough. The Lord's Supper, he says, is more than just a memorial, says Calvin. He says it is certainly symbolic, but the symbols do more than merely represent, he says, David. They actually bring to us the presence of Christ and his benefits. <coughs> Christ's body is locally present in heaven, but Calvin says it does not have to descend in order for believers to truly partake of it. The Holy Spirit makes true fellowship possible here and now. This is what Calvin, John Calvin believed. He says, those who eat the, eat the bread and drink the wine in faith are also by the power of the Holy Spirit actually nourished by the body and blood of Christ. So we had the view of transubstantiation by the Roman Catholics. You had consubstantiation by Luther. You had memorialism or the Baptist view by Woodrich Zwingli, and then you had the Reformed view by John Calvin, or the spiritual presence. And that's out there in Christendom today. And that's how what people believe the Lord suffered to be, erroneously so. Then secondly, we will look at frequency. Some in Christendom partake once a month, once a quarter, mm. or even once a year. I would remember as a boy in the Moravian church, my dad would drag me to, and he would only go once a year, for in Nakhmal, for the communion. He would drag me to churches once a year. So Paul's allusion to the institution of the Lord's Supper by Jesus in the demands to the Corinthians includes these words. In the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you drink this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. 1 Corinthians 11, 25, 26. After the same manner, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death he comes. So, some have a negative. The phrase as often as means that the Corinthians were permitted to partake of the Lord's Supper as often as they chose to do. Anything they decided to without any limitations on the day or the frequency. 
They just thought at any time. Some that they can just the scripture just thought at any time is off the They can never think of the Lord's Supper whenever they chose to. This viewpoint is characterized by two flaws. One, it fails to grasp the grammar and context of the passage. And secondly, it fails to consider everything God says about the matter elsewhere in the New Testament. Neither the Greek nor the English convey the idea that Christians are free to select their own time for partaking of the Lord's Supper. The reader must read that into the text. If the New Testament gave no further directive regarding the frequency of the day of the Lord's Supper, the reader would be free to select his own observance, occasions as the days of the week and frequency. But the Lord gave us additional instructions on the matter. Always to be fair and honest with Scripture, one must gather everything the Bible has to say on the subject and reason about that material correctly to arrive at the totality of God's will on that subject. How is your hermeneutic? Specifically, one must examine the New Testament to ascertain God's will regarding the observance of the Lord's Supper. As it pertains to frequency of observance, we can look at some verses clarifying the matter, providing a complete picture. As they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers, fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. All who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them to all as everyone had need. And continually daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness of heart. Acts 20 verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul spoke to them, intending to depart the next day, and he continued his message until midnight. When they come up again and have broken bread and eaten and taken it for a talk for a while, even until daybreak he departed. Acts 27 and 11. 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 2. Now concerning the collections for the saints, as I directed the church at Galatia, you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you put something aside as he or they may prosper, so that there be no collections when they come. In summing up this matter of frequency, we see the New Testament conveys specific information regarding the what, the when, and how, how, and the why of the observance of the Lord's Supper. Nevertheless, most within Christendom assign no significance to frequency. They just partake whenever they want to. To them, one may partake of the Lord's Supper once a month, quarter, or once a year. However, Scripture is in conflict with this thinking. The biblical view is that God intends for its church to observe the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, every Sunday. And as they were eating, Matthew 26, 26 to 29, Jesus took bread and broke it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, All of you drink of it. This is my blood of the new covenant that is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so that as far as frequency goes. Thirdly, the manner of participation of the Lord's Supper. This is very, became very interesting for me when I researched this matter. The manner of participation of the Lord's Supper how do you participate? What do you do? Some feel it should be a love feast with a full meal being eaten and served. That is the opinion and practice of the Church of Christ group meeting in Cape Town. However, one Stephen Atkinson describes this train of thought and manner of participation as a weekly agape meal, agape meal, or love feast. The elements of communion should, should look back 
for Jesus' death on the cross to pay for sin. The agape meal adds a forward look to be celebrated in a joyful wedding atmosphere. The Lord's Supper typifies the wedding supper of the Lamb. The setting of the Lord's Supper was the Passover feast. If you would remember Exodus 12 verses 8 and 9, the Lamb would be roasted in the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Bitter herb from that time could be wild lettuce, watercress, endive, chicory, cumin, and dandelion would remind Israel how cruel Egyptian slavers made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar in the fields. With all their harsh labor, the, Egypt, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. That's what this bitter herb was for. Exodus 1.14, the unleavened bread would remind them how they had to flee Egypt in haste with no time for the bread to rise. The bitter herb of Passover reminds us today we are no longer slaves to sin, but free in Christ. John 8.36, therefore, if the Son will make you free, you will be free indeed. The bitterness of all our old lives was overcome by Jesus' blood and sacrifice of his body on the cross. Jesus and his disciples reclined around the table abundant with food. As with Passover, the twelve would have understood the Lord's Supper to be part of an actual meal. The Greek for supper is dekdom. Luke 22 verse 20. Also in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, 21, and 25, the word supper comes to the fore. So when you come together, it is not to eat the Lord, it is not to eat the Lord's supper you eat it. It is not the Lord's supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private supper. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in the remembrance of me. And so this date on means banquet. It's the main meal toward evening. It arguably never refers to anything less than a full meal. This could be a bean stew, lamb, olives, butter herbs, a fish sauce, unleavened bread, dates, aroma, aromatized wine. This was more or less the Palestine cuisine during Jesus' time. Some, some still hold to this agape diplom, to having a full meal at the Lord's Supper. The separation of the meal or agape from the Eucharist or Thanksgiving we have, we partake of today, lies outside of New Testament time, argues C.K. Barrett in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. He says the Lord's Supper was still at Corinth, an ordinary meal to which acts of symbolic significance were attached rather than a purely symbolic meal that we have today. However, having said that, Paul acknowledges that we each have houses to eat and drink. 1 Corinthians 11, 22. He says, what? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? He says, certainly not in this matter. The ultimate purpose of the Lord's Supper is not to fill our bellies. The ultimate purpose of the Lord's Supper is to fill our souls. Because mm. you have houses to eat in. It is not necessary to have the Lord's Supper in the context of a sumptuous meal. The affordability of such a meal 
It even be burdensome, some argue, to larger congregations. The bread and fruit of the vine should suffice. The efficacy of the Lord's Supper. Some believe that the bread and grape juice have divine power as in substanti transubstantiation. You remember transubstantiation mm -hmm. in the Roman Catholic view? When the bread and wine are blessed by this priest during Mass, the bread and wine are presumably transformed into the actual physical body and blood of Christ. This change, this change, however, is not detected by the senses. You with me? This has led some Christians to question this is true. It is probably far-fetched and not true. Efficacy is the ability to produce a desired or intended result. <coughs> Meaning, how is the Lord's Supper beneficial? I look at nine benefits to me. God knows we love to eat. <laughs> and that's why he gave us the Lord's Supper. We will not forget. Eh? We would remind, we would be reminded when we go to wedding feasts, and the first thing we do after we leave, we go to any function, we criticize the food one way or another. <laughs> but God says to us through the Lord's Supper, it's a regular opportunity for self-examination. To examine yourself and see if you are in the faith. Second Corinthians 13, 5. It's a regular opportunity to check our relationships in the church. How is the one another? How is the kindness? How is the love? It's a powerful reminder of our forgiveness. It's a reminder of the passing nature of the physical and the eternal nature of the spiritual. It's a concrete reminder that leads us to the abstract. It's a physical reminder that leads us to the spiritual. It focuses on the second coming of Christ. It's a warning of judgment, both in time and in time, for those who do not partake in a worthy manner. It's a reminder to keep the unity among the saints in the bond of peace. Read Ephesians 5.3. And then, maybe, and when I, when, when, when I looked at this, I thought and heard about the past year, Brother Jerry, I thought of this. Mm. It's probably significant to us who just don't understand Jesus and Paul took the matter seriously. It was one of the final acts of Jesus' ministry. We may very well arrive in heaven someday to discover that it's a means of grace in ways that we have never comprehended beyond us. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience for us, whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death of Christ in anticipation of his second coming. Finally, how do we partake of the Lord's Supper in the shape of scripture? According to 1 Corinthians 11, 17 and following, on Sunday, every Sunday, Christians are to partake and to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christians are to partake in a worthy manner, guiltless of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are to example ourselves Deciding the body of Christ and his church in view of judgment, always considering one another. Paul knows, therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you do not come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. First Corinthians 11, 33. Following. And that's what the Word of God teaches. Last Eve, I paused beside the blacksmith going and heard the anger in the voice of the child. Then looking in upon the floor, old Amos warm was deep in years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and better all these hammers so? Just one said he with twinkle in his eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. Mm. And so for ages kept Blows that beat upon the anvil of God's word. And though the noise of holy blows was heard, 
the heaven is unchanged. The heaven is gone. The Bible is unchanged. The scriptures, they too is gone. God bless us.